Hi, everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. I'm Hanka, and today I will give you a brief introduction to Bregman divergences and explain to you how we can use them to generalize the persistence homology. I will start by giving a quick introduction into persistence homology in the Euclidean setting. Persistence homology is a tool to extract topological features from data represented by a set of points. And this is done by the following procedure. Given a set of points in Rn, and uh, as you can see here on my screen in R2, you start by growing balls around each point of your point cloud. And as the radius of the balls increases, the balls necessarily intersect. So whenever n plus one balls intersect, you want to join the corresponding points with an n simplex. And this gives rise to a topological combinatorial structure called a filtered simplicial complex from which the topological features can be extracted by simple calculations. The essential theoretical result here is the Nerf lemma, which that ensures that the filtered simplicial complex has the same homology as the underlying union of balls. Now, why would we want to generalize such a procedure? Well, it turns out that for many types of high dimensional data, it doesn't do such a good job. One way to improve it is to use a different notion of distance, which alters the shape of the balls, such as so. And this is where Bregman divergences come to play. So to define a Bregman divergence, we need to start with a function. So let f be a function from an open and convex subset of Rn to R, which is continuously differentiable, strictly convex, and whose value goes to infinity as the norm of the argument increases. Here is how I visualize f. I squeeze the whole omega, the whole of Rn, onto the x-axis, and onto the y-axis, I put the image of omega under f. And then the graph of f will necessarily look like somewhat a paraboloid. To define the Bregman divergence, recall the Taylor approximation. So the Taylor approximation of first order is the first two terms here in this formula, which we'll call tfy of x. And the Bregman divergence of f from f to y is precisely the value of this rest that it's left. So what the Bregman divergence from f from x to y actually tells us is how well does this first, old, uh, first order Taylor approximation of f approximate the exact value of f at x. And this value can be easily illustrated. So in the graph of f, consider the graphs of two points, x and y. And then draw the graph of the linear approximation tfy, which in the picture is just the tangent space to uh, the graph of f at the graph of y. And then the Bregman divergence is the vertical distance from the graph of uh, f at x to this tangent space. OK, now let's have a look at some properties of Bregman divergences. So first of all, due to the strict convexity of f, the tangent space, or the graph of the tangent space, will always lie below, uh, below the graph of f. And thus, the Bregman divergence from, from x to y is always non-negative. And in addition, the tangent space will only touch the graph at the tangent point. So we know that the Bregman divergence is equal to 0 if and only if the two points coincide. And this is the first uh, property of a metric. However, neither of the other properties, symmetry or triangle inequality, hold. Now recall that we are interested in the shape of balls, where the Euclidean ball with in Rn with center x and radius r is the set of all points in Rn whose distance from the center x 
is uh, less or equal to the radius r. So how do we generalize this notion of a ball into a pregnant divergence? Well, it's pretty simple. You just replace the Euclidean norm with the Bregman divergence. However, since uh, the Bregman divergence is not symmetric, we obtain two types of balls, which we call the primal and the dual balls. So now that we know how a Bregman ball is defined, the next thing to think about is how do the Bregman balls actually look like? Or in other words, how much does the shape of a Bregman ball deviate from what we perceive as a ball? Well, fortunately, it turns out it's not too bad. Bregman balls are contractible and the dual Bregman balls are convex. The primal balls are in general not convex. However, the intersection of Bregman balls is always either non-empty, uh, is always either empty or contractible. And thus we can apply the Nerf lemma. And as it was the case in the Euclidean setting at the beginning of the tutorial, tutorial the filtered simplicial complex that arises by growing Bregman balls around um, a set of points in a point cloud has the same homology as the underlying union of balls and thus captures the desired topological features. As a last part of this tutorial, I would like to show you two widely used Bregman divergences and briefly comment on the shape of their primal Bregman balls. So first of all, we have the kullback leibler divergence, which is widely used in text and image processing. And the primal Bregman balls of uh, this divergence are actually convex. However, you can see that their shape changes as the position of the center um, changes. So if we are very far away from the um, boundary of the positive octant, where the divergence is defined, or where, uh, where which is the domain of F, um, the ball looks almost like a Euclidean ball. However, the closer we get to the boundary of the positive octant, the more triangular shape the ball has. And the second divergence I want to talk about is the Itakura Saito divergence, which is used. Uh, to process speech and sound data. And here, the uh, Bregman balls are not convex. However, their shape does not alter much as you shift um, the center around. On my last slide, I would like to emphasize the difference in size um, with respect to different Bregman divergences. So on this picture, you can see uh, the boundaries of three Bregman balls, which all have the same center and all have the same radius. And the small yellow circle is the boundary of a Euclidean ball. The orange curve is the boundary of a kullback leibler ball. And the red is the boundary of an Itakura Saito ball. And you can see that the difference in size is really striking. All right, and that's it for me. Thanks very much for watching. And if you're interested in more topics from topological data analysis, make sure to check out other videos on our channel.